This is out of Psalm chapter one, starting in verse one. The psalmist writes, blessed is the one. Someone say the one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Whatever they do prospers. And uh, today I want to preach a message entitled Prosperity on Point. Prosperity on Point. And we are kicking off a brand new collection today. I always love the start of a collection. Uh, It's a great invitation saying, hey, you're here at the beginning. Why not stay all the way to the end? (laughs) But we're starting a brand new collection today entitled Wait Till I Get My Money Right. And we're talking about maximizing, managing, and multiplying God's money. Now, I think you got to kind of make a disclaimer as we sort of begin this collection that this is not like a biblical uh, get rich scheme, okay? This is not, this collection is not a money grab. Um, we're not going to be selling miracle water during this collection. Um, nowhere in this collection are we going to ask you to sow a seed for $7,000 so that we can give you seven blessings, okay? That's not coming up at any point. Um, but we aren't going to shy away from talking about God's timeless truths regarding your finances. It's funny, it's almost like you can talk about anything in church, just don't talk about money. In fact, even as I say the word money, some of you kind of clinch up. It's like, are you constipated? No, we're talking about money. (laughs) Some of you don't show up. (laughs) Because it's like, yo, preacher, don't talk to me about my money. To which I would say, totally okay. I'm not gonna talk to you about your money. We're gonna talk to you about God's money. (laughs) That's a very weak response. (laughs) But I'm hoping over the next five weeks that revelation begins to hit your life. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be a Christian, if you are walking in the light, if you are someone who has denied themselves and taken up their cross, please understand that we have to operate from the same premise. And that premise comes from Psalm 24, verse 1, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. What that means is everything you have is actually on loan from God to you. I know you think you made that money, but if you get a bigger revelation, you're going to recognize actually it's God just sharing his money with you. Everything you have, your gifts, your talents, your personality, your work ethic, your effort, that has all been on loan from God to you. Everything is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. Everyone who lives in the earth was given God's grace. God has actually given you everything that you have, whether you realize it or not. We're all just borrowing from God. Your very breath, that's borrowed breath, baby. Remember, God, he breathed into that dirt, and that dirt became a man, and his name is Adam. Please understand, we are all living today on borrowed breath. 
That's why some of us in the room today, we got the revelation that worship, singing praises to God, that's not like a lot of effort. Even this idea of like a sacrifice of praise, it's not really even a sacrifice of praise. When I understand the premise of Psalm 24, I start realizing actually my only reasonable response is to worship God because as I sing praises to God, all I'm actually doing is returning God's breath back to him because it's his breath in my body. And when I sing, I'm saying, God, let me give you back your breath. Somebody ought to praise God today. Just a little bit all over this house. It's all his. It is all his. And we are not talking about your money. We are talking about God's money. And whether you like it or not, there are two topics that affect every human being on the planet. And that is your health and your money. You can't escape these two things. These things matter in life. And what I love about our God is that many preachers would shy away from it and not teach on it. But can I encourage you today that God cares about both of those things in your life. And God actually has some principles and God actually wants to teach you some things about what he says about your health and about your finances. I love what the scripture says here in Psalm chapter one. It says, the one who is blessed. It says, blessed is the one. And even that little phrase, blessed is the one, it speaks volumes to me because it doesn't start by saying blessed is everyone. I think there are things that we do in life that set us up for a blessing. It's not for everyone. It's for the one who operates in a certain mode. It's for the one who operates according to God's timeless truths. Blessed is the one. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. Am I speaking to anybody in the room today? Do you want to be blessed? I think that's a good start. Do you want to be blessed? Blessing is such an important thing that we talk about. And when I talk about blessing, let's, let's just try to get this out of the way quickly because this is so very, very important because this is where things get confusing. When we're speaking about God's blessing, we are not solely talking about possessions and material blessings. I think that's where people kind of get wrong with all the semantics is that when I'm talking about God blessing you, I'm talking about more than money. Come on, how many of y'all know you need more than money? I need God to bless me in ways that are far beyond my money. Some things money can't buy. Money cannot buy you peace. Come on, money cannot buy you joy. <laughs> like it or not, money can't buy you real love. I know some of y'all been trying to buy that. It can buy you some fake love. It can't buy you real love. So, so I, need, I need to be blessed with more than money, but at the same time, I want to understand you that God does bless your finances and God does bless your health. When we talk about blessing, I just wanna make sure we're kind of working from the same premise. The premise, whenever I think about the word blessing, I think about the Old Testament and I think about the way that a father would bless his son. Guess how a father would bless his son? He would lay his hands on his son and he would impart something to his son. When I speak about blessing, what I mean is I need God to touch my life. I need the supernatural touch of God on my life. When God blesses something, he, he touches it. Listen to this. Whatever God touches, he transforms. You, you got to see this because I want God's blessing. I want God to bless my marriage, but the only way he'll transform my marriage is if I let him touch my marriage. I want God to bless my kids, but yo, if I don't ever let him touch my kids, how's he ever gonna transform them? That's why I think it's wild if you can make it a priority to get your kids to the Dolphins game, but you can't figure out how to get your kids into God's house. Do you want the blessing of God on your kids? You gotta give them an opportunity to get touched. God, touch it. Our 
church doesn't just need finances. Our church needs to be transformed. And the only way Vu is going to be transformed is when we allow God to touch us, when we allow God to hold us. It's when he holds us that he starts to mold us. And I don't know about you, but I would sure love God to transform my money. But he ain't going to transform it if I don't allow him to touch it. You think about Baptism Sunday, which I think all this all the way correlates, because baptism is about this moment of saying, God, I'm going all in. I'm giving you all of me, God. You can touch every area of my life. It's funny because all of us have that area that we're not sure if we want God to touch. Ah, not that part. Can I have everything but my boyfriend, you know? We all want God to touch our kids. You can have my kids, God, you know. <laughs> I offer them up to you, but I don't know if I want God touching my wallet. I don't know if I want God touching my budget. But if I don't let him touch it, he can't transform it. So when we speak about blessing, we're talking about more than material things. What we're talking about is we're talking about surrendering and allowing God to transform every area of our life. Why on earth are we gonna shy away from talking about the thing that matters to all of us? My health, my finances. You know, Jesus, his favorite topic to teach about when you see about the sermons that he taught, his most common sermon was the sermon on the kingdom of God. So we talk about the most. His second most favorite topic to use was finances. That's interesting that Jesus didn't shy away from talking about money 2,000 years ago. In fact, one preacher was talking about the fact that you can read different things. There's 200 some scriptures on faith in the Bible, 200 some scriptures on salvation in the Bible. But when it comes to finances and accountability and stewardship, there's some 2,000 verses in the Bible. Jesus didn't shy away from it, and I don't think we should either. I think he has some keys. He has some principles that we should learn and begin to apply in our life. I believe that God wants to bless you. When I say that, that doesn't mean I think that the goal is to get a bigger house and to get all the kids in private school and to retire on a beach drinking, well, you guys are Christians, virgin margaritas. I don't think that's the case. Not Adrian, but the rest of you. I, I, that's not what I mean. I mean, God, I want you to touch every area of my life and I believe that God wants to prosper you. Prosperity is one of these words that we're not allowed to talk about in church. Oh no, Rich is going towards the prosperity gospel. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. In fact, many people have actually criticized me and claimed that that's what I am. I do not subscribe to a prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is a teaching that all suffering is from the devil. Don't believe that. Go read the New Testament. All those guys that followed Jesus, they all died martyrs' deaths. Sorry, prosperity gospel doesn't work for them. <laughs> I, I don't believe that all suffering is evil. I, I, I don't believe that God, the indication that he's endorsed what you're doing is through wealth and health. I don't believe that at all. In fact, I'd actually go as far as to say that sometimes uh, these areas that you have all this wealth is actually a sign of God's judgment, not a sign of God's blessing. I could show you that in Romans 1 sometime that he gives us over to our deepest desires. And sometimes the worst thing God could ever do is give you what you want. Uh, so I don't believe in a prosperity gospel, but I certainly believe that God wants to prosper you. And I think it's important that we define some of these terms over the next five weeks about where we're going. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because this is, when I use the word prosperity for the next few weeks, this is, this is the definition I'm working with. Prosperity is having all that you need to fulfill all that God has called you to do. Prosperity is having all that you need to fulfill all that God has called you to do. God has a mission for your life and a purpose for your life, and he wants to prosper you with the resources that are required in order for you to fulfill the thing that he's spoken to you to do. It's all throughout the Bible. Job chapter 36, verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in, here's that dirty word, prosperity, and their years in pleasures. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I shall not. I got everything I need in Jesus. 
Proverbs chapter three, verse nine, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Even the New Testament, 3 John chapter one, verse two. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Someone say in all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. I want you to have everything that you need from the inside out in order to fulfill all that God has called you to do. And Psalm chapter one starts with this idea that there is one who is blessed. Not everyone, there is one who is blessed. And then our reading today, it ends with this last phrase that always sticks with me. It says, whatever that blessed person does, whatever they do, it prospers. Did you hear that? Whatever they do, prospers. I think we live in a world that is always trying to get you to chase things. They want you to chase paper, chase pleasure, chase power. But that is not what we see in Psalm chapter one about the blessed man or the blessed woman. In fact, the order is completely the opposite. You're not chasing paper. You're not chasing pleasure. You're not chasing prosperity. In fact, the order is different. Prosperity's chasing you. My goal is not to be prosperous. My goal is to honor God. And it just so happens when I do, prosperity is the result. So when I say prosperity on point, it's not about looking or projecting a certain way. It's about understanding the point of prosperity. Why does God want you to prosper? Your prosperity must have a purpose. Must have a purpose. And some of us over the next five weeks, God is going to break your paradigm. You call yourself a Christian, but you live and operate with the exact same paradigm as the world. I'm chasing after affluence. I'm chasing after influence. I'm chasing after power. I'm chasing after success. And when you start to unlock what God speaks to you, you're gonna realize you don't have to chase after any of those things. You chase after Jesus, you chase after his kingdom, and you watch. You can't help but be blessed. Come on, somebody, give God some praise. That's called prosperity on point. Prosperity. On point. I just want to crack open this collection today and just make some basic observations. So much in my heart that I want to teach you. And I believe this collection is going to be much different from any collection you've ever heard, most of us in the room, on, in church when it comes to finances. Uh, I, I want us to see the point of our prosperity, the purpose of our prosperity, and how it correlates with things. Psalm chapter one, let's get into it because it says, blessed is the one, but then watch, there is going to be a path of prosperity. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. What I want you to see is that uh, prosperity correlates with a pattern. There's prosperity in patterns. The scripture says that if you're gonna result in prosperity, the way that you walk, the way that you stand, and the way that you sit matters. There's a posture that you take on. Notice this first verse is all about the pattern of the world. There's a system of the world. The enemy wants you to buy into his pattern. The enemy wants you to buy into a short-term plan. Sin offers you short-term gratification, but completely removes long-term satisfaction. We have hustle culture. We have people that are just trying to get that money. All together, they find themselves more and more less satisfied. It's because they've got the wrong pattern. Think about Romans chapter 12, verse two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you start talking about prosperity on point, when you start talking about finances in the kingdom of God, you have to get a new pattern going. Pattern speaks towards a system or discipline. 
that if you're gonna walk into financial freedom, it requires discipline. That's why this collection is not like, hey, give your money, and then all of a sudden everything's okay. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that. The Bible teaches you principles like discipline. The Bible teaches you principles like stewardship. The Bible, oh, watch this. The Bible teaches you principles like saving. Oh my God. What did he say? What did he say? Saving. Nah, 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 bro. Put that thing on credit. And some of this stuff God has already told us, but we, we miss out. This first part about the scriptures, the man who's blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the pattern of this world. We could talk all about the pattern of this world. There's so many things we could point out. But I think one of the strongest patterns of the world that actually doesn't lead to prosperity, in fact, it leads to what I would say is poverty. I'm not breaking down the system of poverty and how we got there. But one of the things with poverty comes this word called procrastination putting something off, delaying. Um, anybody in the house, where's, where's all the real procrastinators at? Any real procrastinators? Look at this, look at these proud procrastinators. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about real procrastinators. Like I could give you six months to study for the exam <laughs> and you still just gonna start working the night before. Where are you at? Where are you at? Yeah, those are the, yeah that's me, you got me, man, you got me. <laughs> look at what Proverbs says because uh, this is a, uh, this is a convicting scripture. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. Watch this. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. The scripture is correlating the result of poverty with this word procrastination, putting it off to later. I think all of us probably have one of those horror stories of procrastination. And uh, since you're not up here and I am, let me just tell you one of mine. <laughs> uh, maybe about five years ago, I got invited uh, to go and do a, a program at Harvard University. I know that's a flex, but it's true. And um, <laughs> Harvard invited me, which I thought was pretty cool, right? Because it's like, you know, I think I applied to Harvard and they definitely said no. <laughs> but look at Prosperity chasing me down, bro. Now they call him me. All right. <laughs> Shout out Harvard. And uh, I got invited to go do this three-day course with the School of Business. And what they had done is they had taken uh, leaders from a handful of major cities across America, and they had a goal, and the goal was to bring some unity and some strategy to solving some of the city's greatest challenges. And it was truly one of those kind of life-changing types of trips. But, um, you know, like, I got kids, and I got a wife, and I got a job, and they told me before coming there that there was some homework to do. I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't know if I do homework anymore, you know? Like, I'm in my 30s, bro. And uh, they gave me eight different case studies to read and examine. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna do that, but just, come on, man, I'm pretty busy, and uh, this isn't that important. I'm sure I can read. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, I just kept procrastinating until, true story, I get to Harvard, and I walk into class that day, and I haven't read any of the case studies, which like, you know, this might work at some schools, <laughs> but you don't want to go to Harvard without doing your homework. Yeah. I'm sitting in a class of like 50 people and I didn't know. I'm just like, yeah, this is cool. You know, I'm a guest. And I quickly learned that at Harvard, uh, the teachers use this thing. It's called the Socratic method. Yeah, yeah it's named after the philosopher Socrates. Harvard. <laughs> and what it means is the teachers don't tell you the answers. The teachers call on students at random for the answers. Dear God in heaven, Mr. Wilkerson, can you give us some thoughts on this introduction case? Uh, 
Proverbs 3. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I learned quickly that charm doesn't get you very far at Harvard. How many of y'all know that night I went home and I stayed up all night reading those case studies? Why? Because procrastination will leave you in a place that you are unprepared. You know, the seeds of faith is this word called expectation. Many of us are just going through life by default instead of by design. We're just following any pattern. It's like if you don't get a vision for your life and if you don't get a vision for your finances, don't be surprised when somebody else will give you one. If you don't lead your life, somebody else will lead your life. If you don't direct your money, your money will direct you. We don't even have an expectation, but let me just tell you, if you claim to have expectation, the foundation of expectation is preparation. If you're not preparing for it, I don't believe you're expecting it. Do not tell me that you want God to do something great in your life if you're not even preparing for the thing you are believing for. This is just God's word. If you can't be faithful with the little, how on earth can God trust you with a lot? Now, nah, but Pastor Rich, I want to be an entrepreneur. Homie, you haven't ever showed up to your job on time once. How are you living today? I want a worldwide ministry. Okay, I would start serving today. But we, we procrastinate. And what is procrastination really doing? Because some of you are like, what does this have to do with my money? Well, procrastination is all about borrowing time in the future for the present. I don't know if you ever heard the old expression, time is money. Time is money. And many of us, what we don't realize is that we're borrowing time from the future and we're killing it today. Poverty kills time. Prosperity executes time. Do you see the difference? One is just wasteful. The other one is saying, yo, how can I make today matter? How can I get on point today? How can I walk in the way of prosperity today? Procrastination lives with this lie that I'll get to it later. But when is later? Later. Later never is on the calendar. <laughs> later never has a time stamp attached to it. It's just later. And it's later that leaves us losing in life because we are putting off the thing that we already know in our heart to do. Wait till I get my money right. You know what that anthem is all about? That there's so many people that are saying, when I get there, then I'll be. I'm waiting to be happy. You don't wait to be happy. You just start happy. I'm waiting to find my purpose. No, you start finding purpose today. I'm, 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 I'm waiting to be generous. When I get a promotion, when I have this much money, I'll, brother, I don't care how many promotions, I don't care how many raises, if you can't start being generous with $10, you're never gonna be generous with a million dollars. It always takes work. <laughs> Prosperity has a pattern. There's a pattern, 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 there's a pattern. There's a, baptism. You know what? I'm gonna get baptized next month. It's not what the scripture says. It's not a later kind of activity. Today is the day of salvation. I'm not putting off the commands of the Lord. I'm not walking in the way of the wicked. I'm not standing in the way of the sinner. I'm not sitting in the seat of the mocker. I have a different pattern. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. The scripture says in Psalm chapter one, verse two, it gives you this pattern, but then it says, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. I would say it's prosperity and plans. It's prosperity and patterns and it's prosperity and plans. The writer takes time to say that this person who results in prosperity, this person who is blessed, that they meditate on God's word day and night. This word meditate 
is deeper than just thinking about it. Meditation is about absorbing something, reflecting on it, filling your mind with the truths of God. To meditate on it. David said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I always think about God's word like sunblock. I got a drawer full of sunblock at my house. But just because I got the sunblock in my house doesn't mean I get to benefit from the sunblock. Your boy is white, white. I don't tan, I get red, okay? And if I don't apply the sunscreen, I'm going to get burned. I don't care how many Bibles you got in your house. I don't care if you grew up with the Bible being around your house and your mom was reading the Bible or your dad read the Bible or you come to church and you hear me talk out of the Bible. It's like sunscreen in a drawer that hasn't been applied. The benefit of God's word is when you apply God's word. When you apply God's word, it protects you from being burned. Some of y'all keep getting burned in life because you haven't applied the word. God's word has to be applied in order to protect us. And one of the great revelations in your maturity with Christ is when you start to realize that all of God's word is not there to harm you, hurt you. It's there to help you. Like it is there to help you grow and become. He wants to prosper your life. He, he wants to bless you. But you got to apply what he said. Prosperity requires a plan. I'm so grateful for this collection because some of you, it's like, when's he going to get to Malachi chapter 3? Would you believe it? There's so much more in God's Bible regarding your finances other than just Malachi chapter three. There's so much more in God's story other than just the tithe. He wants you to apply his principles so that you can be protected, so that you can run the race of faith. I think I told you, but I am, I'm training right now to run the full marathon in January. Now, yeah, we can clap. I love you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. It's for you and Jesus. Um, and the reason why I keep saying it out loud is because I'm holding myself accountable. Um, it's actually not bragging, it's actually like putting humility in me to go, I have to do this. Uh, but the last two years, if I'm being honest with you, I went and ran the half marathon without training. Not bragging, I was bragging about Harvard, I'm not bragging about this. Um, I, went, I went and ran the half marathon with, without, without training. And to be honest with you, like when you come to the end of the Miami Marathon, there's this part where it splits and it goes, the half finishes and then the other 13 goes that way. And I'm like, the last two years around, I'm like, there is no way <laughs> that I can do another, there's no, I don't know how to do another 13 miles. That's crazy. Like, I can't do it. But I made this decision, I'm, I'm gonna run this marathon. And so I started running and one of my friends was like, Rich, listen, if you're gonna actually do this, you have to get a plan. You can't just go and feel your way into this. You can't just go out there and strong arm your way into this. You need a training plan so that you can sustain and run all 26 miles. So I heeded his advice and I didn't just hear what he said, but I actually started to apply it. And I, I came across um, this study of this guy who teaches people how to do marathons. Thank God for you two. By the way, none of us have an excuse not to grow in an area. You two. And I was listening to uh, these two marathon runners talk and um, they had given five different pillars to training for a marathon. And their first pillar was that you have to do easy runs. I was like, easy runs? Nah, bro, like, I'm not doing nothing easy, you know? Like, doing hard stuff's how you grow, you know? Because every time I go out and run, I just like, Ugh! I'm like, I, I, I convince myself I have asthma every time, you know? Like, <laughs> Like, is tuberculosis? I need to get checked. What's going on, bro? Like, I'm sick. Was my dad a minor? I don't know. Like, and so I'm listening to this conversation and, and this guy is saying, no, no, no. The key to running distance is building a base through long, slow, easy runs. And he gave this analogy. It's just kind of been sticking with me. He's like, there's two ways to mow the grass. One way is you can go out and you can get a razor blade and you could try to cut that grass. The other way is to go buy a lawnmower. Now they both will work, but one is much more effective. But the lie with long distance running is everyone thinks that harder is better. 
Sometimes harder is not better. And I always think the plan of the world, it seems easy up front, but it leads to a harder story that doesn't lead to growth. And what they would teach is they would teach that you have to do these, these long runs. And the long runs is all based upon your heart rate. And you have to run in your aerobic state. You have to run below your maximum aerobic heart rhythm. I learned all this stuff. And so the way that you get that is an equation. You have to take 180 minus your age. So for me, it's 180 minus 39 it means I'm 141. Meaning that when I'm running, I have to keep my heart rate at 141 or below. Now, their training mechanism is they say that you should do 80% of your training below your aerobic heart rate. And you say, Rich, why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because when I go out and I, and I run at a 141 heart rate, you would not believe how slow I have to go. It's embarrassing. I can run a fast mile. In fact, if you hear people talk about me through town, you let them know. <laughs> Saw your pastor yesterday. Man, he's slow. <laughs> uh, today we ran six miles. I ran at an 11 minute pace. So slow. So boring. But what I'm learning, as I've been training now for the last six weeks, is that I'm building a base. And that if I want to run further, oftentimes I have to learn how to run slower. The challenge with running slower is like today, Justin and I are out there running and there was this dude who had the audacity. I don't know where he came from. But this dude, I, it was kind of like, honestly, like offensive. He ran by me four different times on an hour run. I'm like, bro, what are you doing, man? <laughs> and what happens when you're running slow is that you look at someone running fast and you try to run at their pace. You care what they think about you more than what God has spoken to you. And with it, you never get to finish. Some of you in this collection, you're gonna get a revelation that you don't need to live in debt any longer. Some of you, the reason why you're in debt, I know there's all sorts of different stories, just don't take offense. Some of you are in debt because you see people running by you and you're trying to project the same lifestyle and you're buying things you can't even afford. All to look apart, all to, look how fast I run. Dog, you can't run very far. And what we're gonna learn in this collection is that endurance matters more than pace. It's stamina over stride. In God's book, man, it's full of, I don't wanna call them secrets because it's right there. It's right there, but you just gotta read it and apply it. I'm just, I'm late to the running world. That's always been a truth. People have always known this. I just the last two years went out there and ran as hard as I could and about killed myself trying to do 13 miles. But when I get the revelation that I want to last longer and go further, that I actually want to grow, what I need now is a plan and I have to apply it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Prosperity on point is prosperity that has a purpose. And I'll never get a purpose if I don't take on God's pattern, God's plan, and last look at this scripture. We're gonna close. Verse three, the person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit, here it is, in season. Someone say in season. And whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. The last cor correlation is prosperity and planting. Prosperity and planting. Whatever they do prospers. I love this metaphor that my life is like a tree, planted. Something that's planted begins to grow. When we speak and use the word prosper, we're talking about growth, growth. My kids prospering is my kids growing healthy. Our church prospering is our church growing, not just in numbers, but come on, growing in character, growing in depth of knowledge of who Jesus is. 
my, my marriage prospering is my marriage growing, that I'm learning my wife, I'm loving her in a better way. My finances prospering is not me getting rich quick, but it's me growing in the right direction that I would learn to say, man, God hasn't just blessed me for me. I have never been chasing prosperity. I've been following his pattern and his plan, and I've been getting planted, and with it, my finances have begun to grow that I can now be even more generous than I ever have been before. God's blessed me that I might be a blessing. But notice, you're like a tree planted. You don't get a tree unless you first plant a seed. We pray for trees and God's like, here you go. Open up your hand. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gives you seed. You're like, what? What? Nah, I want a tree. Yeah, that is a tree. But you have to plant it. You have to sow it. All throughout the Bible, the greatest principle is the principle of sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Listen to me. If you don't like the harvest you're getting, you have to check the seed you are sowing. If you plant apple seed, you get apple. This isn't just about your finances. This is about every category of your life that your soul would prosper that you'd have prosperity on point, that I know why God is prospering me. I know why certain areas of my life are growing and becoming. I know why God is blessing me because I've actually allowed him to touch it. I've actually allowed him to transform it. And I'm just inviting you just to come on a journey. I promise you, I'm not gonna get up here and try to manipulate you. There's not gonna be an offering at any point during the collection, that's not it at all. It's about some of you walking into freedom that you never knew even existed. But as we begin to look at God's timeless truths, we're gonna discover that our life is to be planted. And when we're planted, we are like a tree. Notice what the scripture says. That tree bears fruit in season. What a powerful little phrase. If I had more time, I would teach you about it. In season. You don't bear fruit in every season. You bear fruit in season season. In fact, I'd put it this way. The tree that bears fruit understands that before it can bear fruit, it has to go through another season where it's bare. And when the tree is bare, it's not afraid if the season's ever going to change. It understands the rhythm of God's timing, that before I can bear fruit, I must be bare. Before I can reap, I must first sow. And when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our money, one of the words that we're gonna to use throughout the next five weeks that I've taught for many, many years is that money is not money in the hands of a believer. Money is a tool and money is seed. And as it leaves my hand, watch this, it never leaves my life. Because as I plant seed, it's only a matter of time. I feel bare as I release it, But as I release it and it's bare, it's just a matter of time. Like a tree that's bare in winter, spring is going to come and there will be a harvest. My prosperity is on point. I'm not chasing prosperity. I don't shy away that God has blessed my family. I'm grateful for his many blessings. The car you drive, the house you live in, that's not a sign that you're in God's will. But it certainly can be a sign that you could say, man, God has been faithful to me. God has helped me in times of need. Today's Baptism Sunday, and um, I just think what we're talking about so connects. Because when, when you think about it, your life is a seed. And today, as many of you make a bold confession of your faith, when you go into the water, what are you representing? You're representing my life is a seed, and now I'm going under the water. But I'm not buried by the water. 
I'm planted in the water. And as I come up out of the water, I am a new creation. I am the harvest of God's faithful labor. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. There's an old story of the Knights of Templar in church history. The Knights were those that fought on behalf of God and they um, would tell stories about them being baptized. And when they got baptized, the stories would say that the knights would go in, but they would hold their sword outside of the water. As if to say, God, you can have all of me, but I'm not giving up my sword. Now I could easily preach that and make them look really bad. That would be very, very easy. I guess what I appreciate it is at least they were being honest. Because many of us, we get baptized and I don't know what it is that you hold outside of the water. Some of us, we hold our cell phone out of the water. <laughs> Baptism Sunday, hey. And baptism is more than a selfie. Baptism is about me saying, I'm being planted. I'm, the seed has to die for the seed to begin to flourish. You think about Jesus Christ, come on somebody. He went to a cross. He died on that cross and they put him into a grave. And everyone would have thought he had been buried, but he had not been buried. He had been planted. And three days later, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the fairest of the fair, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, his name is Jesus Christ. He got up out of that grave. And when he got up out of that grave, it gave all of us the ability to get up out of our grave for the same power that conquered death, hell, and the grave lives inside of all of us. I'm planted, I'm planted, I'm planted, I'm planted. I'm sowing, I'm sowing, I'm sowing. If you wanna harvest, you too, you have to sow. And I don't want it to be an awkward topic. I just wanted to take this first week to edge in to the shallow end of the pool. For the next few weeks, I'm gonna be bold. Some of us, You've never, maybe you've complained, but you keep paying Netflix and you've never given a dime to God. You keep getting new outfits, but you've never given a penny to God. Some of us in this collection, we're gonna be convicted to say, Lord, I wanna give you all of me, all of me. And I wanna trust that Lord, you will bring about a harvest as I faithfully follow you. My prosperity is on point. Come on, everybody, would you give God a big round of applause? Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor. If it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.